So today at church, as we continue to be at home and doing our devotions virtually, um, and continuing this week on a theme of trust, trusting God in our faith, I think about a time actually, and I'd like to pose to you, think of a time in your own life when you had to do something that you knew was the right thing to do, but in doing so, it went against what everybody else around you was doing, whether it was some action at a party or with a, a team or with a group of, excuse me, a group of friends. And I recall, six years old, uh, my mom worked in a florist shop and out behind this shop, there was a hillside and it went down to a big lake. Um, and I used to walk around the lake and look for turtles and fish and frogs and catch them and whatnot. And I remember walking around the lake one time, um, around behind the florist shop where there were homes and there was a group of boys. And there was a lady that lived two doors down from the florist shop who had on a, a rack a rowboat, which I always stayed away from, and which my mom had gone over the rules of, of how I was supposed to be around the lake and what I could and could not do. And one of the rules was I wasn't to touch anybody's boat or anybody's property. Well, these boys, about five or six of them, had taken the boat off of the rack and I was there, and I told them to stop, but they didn't. And they took the boat out into the lake. And I went back to the florist shop because I didn't want to be out there with them. Well, the neighbor had seen me, knew me, and had seen me with these boys. And so she told my mother that I had been one of them who had taken the boat. And my mom asked me about it, and I, I told her the truth, but she didn't believe me and because the neighbor had sworn that I had been one of them, and so I was punished anyway. And so I, at, at that young age, I thought about the unfairness of it all, about doing the right thing, even when I still got a punishment for it. I think that was maybe when I was 20, it came back up, and I said, do you remember that time? You know, I, I really was telling you the truth. But it reminds me of a Bible story of, of trusting God. And even when all the salmon are swimming downstream, you're going up. You know, you are doing what you think is right because that's what Christ calls us to do. And it reminds me of a story actually in the Old Testament with King Hezekiah, one of the great kings of Judah. And Hezekiah was trying to overthrow or throw off uh, dependency on the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. And he refused to pay tribute. And he, he uh, told the Assyrian king, Judah's not going to be your whipping boy anymore. And the king of Assyria came down and annihilated much of Judah. Judah's armies were no match. Assyria was the superpower of the day. They were the next power after Egypt, the next great kingdom. And they wiped Israel out, and Hezekiah had to come back as Jerusalem was under siege and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. And so he paid tribute, and in the Bible, uh, Sennacherib is recorded as calling him his bird in a cage in Jerusalem, that uh, he had a lot of bluster and talk, but when it came down to it, uh, he pretty much emasculated him in front of the people. Well. It wasn't over. Hezekiah went back to the well because he just didn't feel like it was right for Israel to have to pay tribute to this barbaric people, the Assyrians, who had mutilated and destroyed and, and really annihilated the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. You've heard of the ten lost tribes of Israel, well, the Assyrians, or who wiped them out. So Hezekiah makes a treaty with the king of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh, and when the Assyrian king finds out, he's apoplectic. He says, that's it. That's the last straw. Not only am I going back to, to Israel, to Judah, but I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'll have Hezekiah mutilated and executed in front of me, and that city will never have people again. I'll make sure of it. 
So he takes his army, he lays siege to all these great Judaic cities, and he's outside the gates. Uh, you can find the story in 2 Kings 18. I'm sorry, Kings 18. And as he's, uh, he sends his, his general, Rebake, Rebakshab, to, to the, uh, within arrow range, you know, and Hezekiah sends out some groups to parlay some terms of peace. And this, uh, this general, let me make sure I get his name right. I wrote it down. His, his name is Rob Sheke. He says in Hebrew, send out Hezekiah. You know, he's hiding behind your walls. And then he speaks to the troops on the walls. And he says, your king is not going to be able to save you, nor is your God going to be able to save you. Choose life instead of death. We are going to destroy this city one way or the other. You see all these siege engines. You see this grand army. You don't have a chance. And we will mutilate you. We will skin you alive. And he's saying this in Hebrew. And the, the, the Jewish negotiators are saying, don't speak in Hebrew. Speak in Aramaic so that they, the people can't, they can hear you from the walls. The people are starving because you've laid siege. So please... Uh, speak so in, a, in a tongue that they can't understand. Because they're afraid that the people who are starving might say, yeah, uh, they're going to let us live. They're going to let us live. We might not be able to keep our homes, but at least we'll be alive. And Hezekiah prays. And God says, trust me. No matter the pressure on the people or the army or this grand army, 180,000, 200,000 troops of Assyria that are outside, tomorrow they'll be gone. Very similar to what God says to Moses when the king of Egypt is riding down on them and they're caught between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army in the Exodus. And in that moment, and I think about all the leaders of what's going on today and all the pressures, you know, Let's reopen now. Let's and all the all the groups, all the the strong nationalistic groups that are you know taking assault rifles and going on the steps of of uh, government houses and uh, courthouses and saying you know we want our freedom. You know you can't make us stay at home anymore. This is uh, anti-American. And the pressure of those governors, the pressure of senators and and reps and, and the president and, and all their world leaders, different people saying, you got to do this, you got to do that. Just like Hezekiah. But unlike a lot of leaders, Hezekiah went to God and he prayed. And he said, what do I do? Maybe it is better that the people live. And God said, no, trust me. Do you imagine that? an army of over 200,000 and your people are starving and you think, if I make the wrong decision, Judah's done. I'll be the last king ever. The last in David's line. God says, will you trust me? Even when nobody's here to back you up, nobody's here to tell you exactly what the right answer is because you don't know. It's going to happen, right? Just like we don't know when this is going to end. God says, I've got you. Will you let me work a little? Will you back off and give me the wheel of your life? And Hezekiah does. And I'll have you go back into Kings, 2 Kings 18, and see what happens. But I promise you, it, it's a good ending for Hezekiah and the people of Israel. So how about you? Can we lay off the wheel a little bit and trust that God's got us amid all the panic and anxiety? Amid not knowing what tomorrow will be? God says, hey, I'm the sovereign one of Israel, of the world, of the universe, of all that's made that you have no idea about. Will you back off a little bit and let me be in the driver's seat? May God's peace be with you this day.